Hello, my name is Leah Fiore Tracy, and welcome to Take Me to Eternity. Today we have a compelling episode diving deep into the nuances of theological discourse that are taking place inside the Christian community. As I'm sure at least some of you know, American Gospel has released a four-hour roundtable discussion that took place between Sam Storms, Michael Brown, Jim Osmond, and Justin Peters. If you haven't subscribed to AGTV, I highly recommend that you do. It's well worth it. I thought it would be fun and insightful to review that discussion with people who might have a thing or two to say about it. This will be the first of two reviews that I'll be doing. Matthew seven fifteen to 23 Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. We're just going to jump in and introduce my guests, as you can see them right here. Um, First, we have Daniel Chapman, who is a Christian YouTuber. His channel is Daniel C. or Daniel C. Guy, where he refutes word of faith doctrine with both humor and scripture. He is an ex-charismatic with a heart to help people come out of deception and a true love for the body. Next, we have David Lovey, who is a Jewish Calvinistic Baptist cessationist ninja, to be precise. (laughs) Told you I was going to use that. That's right. (laughs) He's a pastor. Can you repeat that? that? Because uh, that's, it's really the essence of who I am. Though, those were the ninja, the ninja part or the cessationist I mean, most, mostly part. the very end of it, it the ninja <laughs> part really is uh but that that statement sort of encapsulates david lovey yeah it does too a jewish <laughs> calvinistic baptist cessationist ninja wow. that's right very precise what i He's am also a pastor a teacher and a writer a man with many hats and a great expositor of the word so Hello, my friends. Welcome. How are you? I did not tell you to write that. That's really nice. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for saying that. It's not really nice. Yeah. (laughs) Thanks for having us. So I guess we're just going to start right off with the questions. We're talking about the um, the four hour discussion between. Sam Storms, Michael Brown, Jim Osman, and Justin Peters. And uh, this is going to, it's, it's four hours. There's a lot of content. So we have a lot of questions right off the bat. um, Justin Peters lays out a definition of what a false teacher and prophet is. He emphasizes behaviors and teachings that are contrary to Orthodox Christian beliefs. Storms then adds the denial of foundational truth without which a person can be saved. And I actually think that was a dirty tactic. There was a, dis- a disagreement between them on the criteria for labeling someone as a false teacher or a false prophet. What do you guys think about the distinction between false teacher and the agreed upon definition? Go ahead, Mr. David, Mr. Ninja. <laughs> I want to ninja. Do- <laughs> All right. Um, well, so when you say the agreed upon definition, I think that they have sort of two different definitions that that they give. And and so I don't really think that there was really an agreed upon definition. The, and the reason being because the really dirty tactic that those guys were doing was 
saying that by saying someone is a false teacher, that by saying that, that means that you are playing God and condemning that person to hell. And so, so they're not actually talking about whether or not the person is actually false or not false. That's not even what the discussion is even about. What the discussion was about from the charismatic side of the table was the, whether we are being so hypercritical like a Pharisee that we're just condemning people to hell willy nilly and even Sam Storms. Sorry, I'm getting off the topic a little bit from the question that you just asked. But, you know, Sam Storms famously said on Remnant Radio, these critics, if you part your hair the wrong way, they'll condemn you to hell. And it's yeah. like, dude, sh shut up, dude. That's, no one is saying that. Like, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but uh, uh, like no one is saying that. Right. So it's a straw man. It's it's a it's a tactic that they're using because they they can't actually defend from the Bible the insanity that is coming out of the charismatic movement. They can't actually defend it. And so instead of instead of standing up and saying, you know, this is wrong and we can admit that it's wrong and we condemn this practice entirely instead of doing that, they have to. Uh, you know, say that anyone who criticizes it is all at, at all is like a Pharisee that looks at like the Gentiles, like a fair, like how a Pharisee would look at the Gentiles as dogs and outcasts and those who cannot be saved and wouldn't, you know, dare go into the house of a tax collector. Like that's what they're trying to make the cessationist. I would say the actually biblical position, that's what they're trying to make it out to be. Or they're, that's what they're trying to make discernment ministries, which not all of them are even cessationist, um, you know, trying to, to make discernment ministries as a whole something that is, um, uh, you know, should should not be. They don't They don't believe in discerning truth from error. They don't believe that it's possible, which is which makes it even. And, I, and then I'll shut up. I'll be quiet. I'll stop using that word also because I know this is a family show. So, so, but like, they they won't even use that word like that in their in their own life, like in their own. They they can't they can't actually be discerning. I mean, though I shouldn't say that because Michael Brown, you know, he calls himself very discerning. He does. He he says that about himself. But but that's another topic. So anyway, all I'm just saying is to, to answer your question is that because that is the framework through which the charismatic side of the table is approaching this, because their position is actually indefensible from the Bible. So they just have to attack the the discernment people as being Pharisees. Um there is no agreed upon definition then. They cannot even say that a person is a false teacher. I would love to ask Michael Brown the question. You don't know Muhammad. You've never met Muhammad before. Is Was Muhammad a false teacher? I mean, all you have is the writings that he put out there. Like, can you not discern it from that? You have to know him personally. Was Joseph Smith a false teacher? You know, like, anyway. Well, he had... He had no problem calling Luther a false teacher. I mean, he had no pro problem um, saying he doesn't believe that Luther was saved. And, you know, you see him do that on his show. He weaponizes when anybody says, like, this person could be a false teacher. He just weaponizes it and says, well, you're just trying to say they couldn't be saved. You don't know their heart. And the whole time it seems like it's like... Um, you can't say they're a false teacher because you don't know their heart, but I can tell you they're not a false teacher because I know their heart. You know, it's just, it's, it's a thought stopping tactic. It's just a way for him to deflect it and not have to deal with it. So I, what do you I, think? Know, I, I know Mike Bickle to the depths of his soul. Right? Yep. What do you think yeah. about that, Daniel? Yeah, what I was going to say, I suppose what I bring to the conversation, <clears throat> excuse me, is that I was saved in the Brownsville revival under Michael Brown. And I've obviously followed him, John Kilpatrick, Steve Hill quite a bit. Um, it's important, I think, in the context of not only this question, but that roundtable that 
from the onset, when you have the conversation set that the way that it was, everybody knew with this conversation that these are obviously two quote unquote opposing sides having a dialogue, trying to reach some kind of summation of resolution at the end. Um, everything is seemingly tactical when Michael Brown and Sam Storms, you know, and you try to go into these conversations unbiased, but everything was seemingly tactical from the onset, even when we started to to um, address the actual definition of what a false teacher was. And immediately Brown specifically enters into this amplification of consequence, right? We, we go, we go down this side alley of, okay, well then if we're going to sit here and we're going to supposedly talk about discernment, they took this left field hit where they say, well, then you have to be willing to damn that person to hell. And it's like, whoa, 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 wait a second here. We're just calling out the ability to have discernment amongst brothers seemingly um, and to be able to call someone out as a false teacher. Now you're just going to take it to the next level, which is a complete fear move, batting the ball into Osmond and Peter's side of the court saying, well, if you're going to call anybody out, i.e. my friends, i.e. Sid Roth, i.e. Benny Hinn, well, then you're also going to have to take it to the next level and condemn these people to hell. Now, I will say that a lot of the people that I um, look into, that I address, a lot of people the the ninja um, that looks into, you know, they are already in and of themselves putting themselves on that judgment seat. <clears throat> there are a lot of false teachers out there, as Christ forewarned us, that are condemning themselves to hell, that are mil lead millions of people to hell. But it wasn't the context of dis of um, defining what the false teacher was from the onset. It wasn't the context of the conversation to begin with. So to just they come right out of the gate like a, a hyped up greyhound, you know, just being like, well, you know, you you guys better be ready to damn some people to hell. And and it, it was just seemingly completely unnecessary. But in reality, and I think as we go through this conversation and we start to really examine some of the tactics that Brown does specifically in storms. Um, in regards to what you guys have already addressed, as far as, you know, I knew Mike because of the depths of his soul. And um, especially when we start to bring scripture into it, you know, they are coming from a position of trying to defend people who have damned themselves to hell by their actions, by their teachings. Um, so it was just a really um, uh, a shady tactic and, and kind of uncalled for, especially when the conversation was just getting started. And I had read some articles um, that were discussing the roundtable. And they had said very much the same thing. They were coming out and right away contorting the actual definition of what a false teacher was. Yeah, it was totally tactical. I mean, <clears throat> when you listen throughout the whole discussion, I, I kept thinking about, you know, uh, your word of faith is showing because they kept bringing up the, um, well, you don't know their heart and if you're calling them false teacher, then you're damning them to hell. And the more that they said that, the more I'm like, you know, it's almost as if they were trying to um, say that by saying someone's a false teacher, you literally can be damning them to hell. And it's like uh, Peters and Osmond both made the point, like, we're not God. You know, we can't damn someone to hell. That's not even the point. We're just saying right. that they're false teachers. But, you know, if you know the worldview of, the new apostolic reformation the word of faith and you understand the background and the people that they are hanging out with and the their theology their theological undergirding um it just starts showing when you see the tactics that they're using and it, it's it's gross you know i don't know how some people don't see some of the um underlying reasons that they say and do the things that they do there was a theme throughout the discussion peters was bringing up an issue about a false teacher and storms and brown were saying which you don't know if that's true like how do you, well how do you know if they didn't go to heaven and back how do you know if they didn't have this visitation while they were in their bathtub it, they didn't bring that one up i did but um you know it was just this constant like but do, how do you know it's not true so how do we deal with an issue of the lack of discernment and accountability um or lack of that within the christian community as a whole like not just at, in the charismatic side but there is a, a lack of discernment throughout just all of christendom at this point what do we do about that um i think that's a great question I wanted to say one more thing about what we were just talking about, and that was 
that um I did I tell you guys that I met Mike Bickle? No. no. You not heard that story? Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, I just have to I just have to tell you. I just have to tell you this just really quick. This is a good story of Mike an actual Mike Bickle story that that actually has to do with the question that you're asking right now. And that is uh I'm I got married and um my wife had left her car in Arizona. She's from Oregon but lived in Arizona and I had to fly out and get it and drive it across the country back to Chicago again. And um uh, and uh uh anyway, I was driving through Kansas City. I wanted to stop um at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. I think it's Midwestern. Yeah, is that what it is? Yeah, I think it is. And uh you know, just visit the place or whatever. And this dude was there named Dan Kogan. Do you know who that guy is? That name rings a bell, but no. Yeah, he's like, uh, I don't know, well, you know, doing this, not not what this is, not what we're doing, but some kind of similar-ish video making thing, whatever. <laughs> anyway, so so um, then the dude was like, you want to go, you know, once you, since you're here, you want to go visit Mike Bickle and like maybe you could interview him and, you know, like sit down and put it in the cessationist movie right and i was like oh yes oh i, I will absolutely do that <laughs> for real and uh and i was texting with justin peters like dude i'm about to go and ask mike bickle if he wants to be in cessationist <laughs> and and if we if he wants us you know if he would sit for an interview and he's like yeah man let me let me call up phil johnson and then phil johnson's like dude 100 percent I will sit down and we will interview that dude like for the movie, right? Like, oh, this is going to be amazing. And so we went to IHOP. I don't know if you either of you ever been there before? No. Nope. It's it's a um it's like a, a strip mall. It's a strip mall, okay? That's like that's what the building is. Like they took they took like you know like a 711 and like a tanning salon and like <laughs> like a nail salon whatever like and took all those businesses out and put ihop in there that's what that that place is so which i did i didn't expect that actually so mm. they have this like 24 supposedly but it's actually not really 24 hour a day prayer for the last 27 years or something and it's like there's like some clock on the wall that's saying how long uh you know the prayer has been going on for 24 hours a day but then i literally saw uh a sign on the wall saying prayer room is going to be closed next week from like 3 to 5 p.m (laughs) so it's not by the way i mean i'm just saying I'm not to, to make a mountain out of a molehill, but like they're the ones who are claiming that claim that this 24 seven, never, ever, never, ever nonstop prayer is going on in that room. And that's simply not true. Actually, it's actually false. And so we went in there and there's Mike Bickle, like on his computer typing away to like preach his sermon that night. This is not long before he was caught up, you know, I mean, not super long. Uh, and, and I just walked up to the dude. Now, I had decided, my friend, that dude, Dan Kogan, he had said to me, like, oh, I'll introduce you. I, he's met me before or whatever. And, and I was like, dude, I'm not going to shake that guy's hand, man. <laughs> All right. Mm-hmm. Like, if he intro- if he sh- sticks his hand out, I'm just going to be like, no thanks, you know. Um, I just didn't want to. He's, t- he's too slimy for me, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and I know I'm a sinner, too. But, like, that dude... He's like he's slimy, man, and and pro- probably probably actually needs uh demon oppressed himself. But but anyway, uh, and I go up to dude, and he's like he sticks out his hand, and I was like, dude, I don't shake hands. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> this is a funny story. So then so then I'm I'm asking him. I'm like, 
dude, would you want to be in the cessationist movie? I'm the writer of the movie. And he's like, I know all about your movie that you're making, right? He said, absolutely, I will do it. I will be in your movie. You can interview me. I was like, what if like, I invite my friends, Phil Johnson and Justin Peters, to be a part of the interview as well? And he's 100%. I'm all the way down to do wow. it. I was like, wow, that's amazing, man. It's amazing. And he looks over it, like into the distance. And he's like this, like he like nods his head. All right. And then we, I start talking to him like, well, what time is good for you? Because I'm like ready. I'm, I'm like, we're ready to go next week, whenever, you know. And all of a sudden I feel like, you know, now I've been working out, dude, lately. So I, I I got some muscles now, just a little bit of not a lot of muscles, but a little bit of muscles. But like <laughs> this like big hand like grabbed my shoulder and I turned around. This big dude, six foot three, two hundred and ninety pound dude. Like he's like, What it can I help you? And I was like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then he was like, Yeah. Uh, why are you here right now? I said, oh, I was asking Mr. Bickle if you wanted to be in a film that I'm making. And then he said, oh, okay. Hey, see that door right there? Why don't you walk through that door? Now, there's a door right next to Mike Bickle, right? Oh, by the way, by the way, when that dude grabbed my shoulder, I turned around. He stuck out his hand and I shook it. <laughs> Jeez. I'm such an idiot. All right. I like I wasn't even thinking, you know, but just instinctually, I just shake the dude's hand. But what and Mike and Mike Bickle's like literally sitting one foot away from, from me. The dude who I just said, I don't shake hands with people. <laughs> anyway, I'm just an idiot. So so they push the door open and it's the outside parking lot, man. The dude uh -huh. pushed us into the parking lot. <laughs> like cut off the conversation okay cut off and then pushed us out and wow. i was like oh what like that is that like you're kicking us out you know and he's like the dude is like this man he's like yeah you know what why are you here what do you you're from the cessationist thing or whatever like no, no. What, what, you know, what do you, why are you trying to interview Mike? Now you're just trying to cause trouble, you know? And I was like, I'm not trying to cause trouble, man. I'm not trying to do that. And then he said, well, why don't you sit down here with me? And I sat down, me and that dude, Dan Kogan, and this guy, we sat down at a table and talked about what's going on at IHOP for like the last 40 years or 20, 30, however long that thing has been around for. Um, yeah. And, uh, and what the dude said, he, he, I don't even know his, I don't remember his name. He's Mike Bickle's personal liaison. That's what his title was. Okay. Um, what, what he said to me was, he's like, cause I asked him, I said, how many prophecies have to be false before you can call someone a false prophet? Like how many, you know, and how many, how many prophecies have been false that have been issued here in this place? And he said, oh, honestly, I would say like 99.9% .9 of the prophecies that have ever been issued here have not come to pass, but, but we can point to three of them. There are three prophecies that came to pass, but all the rest have not from all the hundreds of thousands of people that have gone through those doors and prophesied. They can point to three instances where someone might have said something that later happened, right? Like those odds are really bad. <laughs> That's yeah. such a bad percentage. But here's the point. So this is why I'm bringing this long story up because I sat down with that dude and I asked him, would you ever be willing to call anyone in the whole world a false teacher or a false prophet? Like, would you ever be willing to do that? And he said this. I mean, because the Bible says that there are such things. So if there are such things, you need to give me an example of one that you believe is such a thing. You mm -hmm. need to tell me that then, right? Because if the Bible says that they are in the world, but you can't give me a single example of what a, what a false prophet could possibly be if you can't do that then you are going to be deceived by them mm -hmm. like 
that I really think that that's what is at root here. And this is what the dude said to me, man. He's this is Mike Bickle's personal liaison. He said to me, are you asking me what we would say publicly or are you asking me on a personal level what I think? And I said, oh, both. I need to know both. <laughs> and he's yeah. like, you cannot you cannot record this. So I wanted to, man, but I did not record it. But he said to me, man, on a public level, we would never call anyone a false prophet or a false teacher. IHOP would never, ever, ever do that. Um, and the reason why we will never do it is because we believe that the only people that that false prophets are are those who go to hell. And because we cannot condemn anyone to hell, we can never call someone a false prophet or a false teacher. Right. This is their logic. OK. And I said, OK, so that's publicly you would say that. What about what you said privately? What 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 would you believe then? And he said, I mean, I believe that there are false prophets in the world today. And I said, give me an example, dude. That's what I'm asking for. And he said to me, well, I can tell you here's here's as far as I'll go. He said, I could tell you there is one person that will never platform again here. And I said, who? I would like to know who. And he said, Todd Bentley. We'll never have Todd Bentley come back here to IHOP and preach again. Well, I mean, man, you are really digging the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> All right, for, for real. The dude who punches people in the mouth and pops their teeth out. Like, <laughs> right. the, taking the old lady in the face with the biker boot guy. Like, so, how, how bad do you have to? How bad do you have to be? Do you literally have to like punt an old lady in the face with your biker boot for them to say, no, nah, we don't want anything to do with you anymore? Well, how here, here, Leah Fiore. I mean, how do you know that that's not what God told him to do? Mm. All right. Like, how do you know that? Do you know with absolute 100 percent certainty that God didn't tell him to knock that man over and the tooth pop right out of his mouth or kick the woman in the face with the biker boot? Maybe the Holy Spirit. He does very strange things in the world today. Maybe that's what he told him to do. How do you know? That's the argument. Mm. It's the dumbest argument, though. It really is. PhD from New York University. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, like, that's that's a pretty prestigious degree that Michael Brown has. All right. And and Sam Storms also has prestigious academic achievements. And both of those men have been published. Dude, Sam Storms has like 20 books published by Crossway. Okay. Now I know that Crossway, just personally, I, I might get in trouble. But I don't care. <laughs> All right. Like, honestly, I think Crossway has lost its way, kind of. Mm -hmm. and, and and I think I know some personal information about people that used to run that place, too, that, like, would, would lead me to believe that. Um, but my point it, is, he's like... Most Christian pub publishing companies have. Yes. I mean, you, I, I, I trust Banner of Truth. You know, I, I like uh, Re Re Reformation Heritage. I like those two publishers. Those are really the only two publishers I go with now. Christian Focus sometimes has some good stuff. But anyway, anyway, the point is just that, like, they can't say it. You know, they they can't they can't come up with a with anyone. And and that's to me that's really it's actually tragic. It's it's tragic because. Um, what it, what it actually proves is that a person can be incredibly intellectually intelligent and know ancient languages and, and you know be able to do amazing uh, sneaky tactics on a debate stage and um, and he knows like the rules of debate and all of that stuff and like, that that kind of a person can be deceived and deceive others, and even when their degree is in Bible, even when their degree is in the New Testament or, you know, historical theology, or even if they're an expert in the history and life of Jonathan Edwards, as Sam Storms is, 
He mm-hmm. is he is an expert in Edwardsian study, and uh, and I know that because I published a book on Edwards back in 2013. And like I, at that time, I read a lot of Sam Storms because of his work in that, and and I wasn't even really aware of this side of him. Um, but man, even though he has that good stuff, and even though Michael Brown um, wrote answering Jewish objections to Jesus, a six volume uh, study on actual, actually answering, you know, the Jewish misconceptions about Jesus. That is truly the standard for Jewish apologetics ever written in history. That is the standard. And it's amazing to me then the incredible cognitive dif- dissonance that such a person can have where like man i'm i'm like this close to myself saying i think michael brown is a false teacher himself you know um i mean i it's it pains me to say it it actually does um because well, I'll, I'll say it. I totally believe he's a false teacher. I, I started out thinking that he was just deceived. And the more that I look into him and the more that I see things like um, him endorsing Kevin Zadai's book. Yeah. And he acknowledged that before he endorsed it, he knew there was heresy in it. And he said, I put a warning in it so that like, I thought that was good enough. And um, the, quotes from that book uh, are just disgusting he was saying let me see if i can i've never read that book so um at one hour and 43 minutes they were talking about it and they actually brought up the fact that they brought up um kevin zadai and the book and they even said that uh brown had endorsed it which that was like a missed opportunity for like, I was waiting for them to hit that and they didn't. Um, but his Kevin, son-in-law. His, yeah. so his son-in-law, um, his yeah. name is, I know what his name is. It's like Brian something. Anyways, his son-in-law is who it's his best friend. And he, he asked him um, to, says, yeah, he asked Brown to endorse Kevin Zadai's book. And so in the book, Zadai said that Jesus told him about what happened after he died on the cross, that he went to hell and suffered. And he said that Jesus told him it didn't just end on the cross. Like, and, and this is a book that was endorsed by him. And he said, this is a great book, even though it has heresy in it. So it's like, what are the standards if you can't even say, no, I'm not going to endorse a book that's got heresy in it. Like you have no standards at that point. And at that point you are just bolstering up the false teachers, the false, like we see who he is defending and um, going on their shows and it's, yeah, it's just disgusting. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I I only yeah. I mean, here here's why I said I'm this far away from it. Although I based on all of those things, you're right. You're right. It's it's because hmm, it's because of that what I said before that that like him and Storms both they have some material that they've written that is like extremely orthodox and and would would be considered helpful you know like that if if you did not if you took away this entire aspect of both of these men's ministries if you took away all of this pushed all of that away there's i mean And I'm controversial for saying this because I know that there's a tendency just to say, you know, Brown is all the way bad in everything. But here's the thing. He's not in everything. And and in some ways, 
that makes him more dangerous or yeah. or, or dangerous um to a different group of people who wouldn't otherwise um you know be reached right because because there are people who i mean obviously brown right now you know i should you're totally right he really is really bad like the what the, that guy's doing is so bad even if he wrote a book on homosexuality that was also really really helpful and really good and and he wrote um He's written like History of the Church and the Jewish People, which is also really fascinating. It's it's a book called Our Hands Are Stained with Blood. And I read that book a long, long time ago. Just documents the the history of anti-Semitism within the church. And I understand it is a tactic. I know I'm skipping ahead here and I'm talking too much. So I want Daniel to really talk. All right. But um you know, I understand why he's bringing up Luther because Luther really did say bad things, like evil things against Jewish people. And the whole, his whole shtick is that he's a Jewish guy. All right. Well, I'm a Jewish guy too. I am. And like, I don't, I don't need to flaunt my Jewishness, but whatever. It, do, to, it doesn't matter to me because Christ is, taken down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. And so there's there's therefore neither Jew nor Greek. That's the way that I look at it, even though I have a heart for my people, you know. But but he will play the victim. He can't lose now. Do you understand? Because yep. by bringing that up and bringing Chris Roseboro into this, now it's impossible for Michael Brown to lose. You know why? Because... No matter what anyone says, he's going to be like this. AGTV, they are anti-Semites, and they just hate Jewish people. And this is, he's shifted the entire argument now to something completely different than what the whole thing was actually about. And now it's like about Nazism and anti-Semitism, yeah. and it's, and he will play a victim. And he said on it, I watched the follow-up thing where he said on the show, like, just breaks my heart. It just, it just breaks my heart. I just can't. It's despicable what these people are doing. That is a, an act. Yep. It's not, it's not real. He's not like really like, oh, I just wish Justin Peters would see his anti-Semitistic, anti-Semite friends. I, I wish he would just see them. Like, Stop it. <laughs> That's go, so so true. go back to the question. I mean, that you, <laughs> what you just said is so pertinent to the question. What do we do about that? If, if somebody who is solid is sitting there viewing Sam Storms and Michael Brown and looking at the things that they have published and saying they're in, they're highly intelligent, they know what they're talking about and they have really good literature out there. But at the same time, what, you know, Brown doesn't just teach what's right. He says all of the right things in the right company. And then he turns around and some of the stuff that he teaches is, you know, it, okay, if you're teaching at Bethel School, if you're teaching at Wagner University, you cannot be teaching all good theologically sound stuff there like it's not going to happen and so when you listen to him you can catch him spouting out a lot of the nar stuff but he kind of sprinkles it so that people don't automatically catch on unless you know so what do we do in the body seeing what's happening knowing that there is no discernment and accountability and people are listening to people like him saying well he says these wonderful things, so we should totally like not just throw them out altogether. But yeah, so, so you because you can't you can't have a half false teacher. Yeah. I know, right. I know, and that really that's it for me. I just I have you know you can't have a half false teacher, and he is a false teacher in half of his life, or or probably more than that. He is. Yeah. And and he and he could still give a you know probably a really amazing lecture on 
you know, some kind of Hebrew Semitic language, and you know, Ugardic or something, and he could give like a really good uh, Christian-based, you know, like talk about a Hebrew verb, you know, in some obscure text, and it'd be edifying to the body, right? But you're right, though, like, you can't be a half false teacher. That that's not how it works. It's you know you can't you can't teach like the body really horrible horrible anti Christian heretical teachings and still call yourself um, you know a man of God. Yeah, I was gonna say. What do you, what do you think so, about that, Daniel? That's what I was just gonna say. Yeah, I was gonna say that. Um, I agree. When, for example, when you team. Uh, Michael Brown up with James White, you you have superpowers in defense of the Trinity. I mean, you're talking about their polemics are, you know, pretty much unmatched. And so that speaks to what you were talking about, David, with uh, the danger that Michael Brown presents. Um, so going through this conversation at the round table, I almost kind of had to mentally separate them and kind of see their tactics and how it was being applied to the conversation. Um, but we have to remember, especially in the case of Michael Brown, we're talking about a false prophet, like a verified false prophet. This man gave the prophecy of Brownsville that there was going to be a bigger Brownsville youth revival, and that's never happened. So that in and of itself speaks to his character, the notion of quote unquote hearing from God, what he's willing to say, and the discernment of prophecy, which also speaks to the discernment of, of people that he works with, <clears throat> his stance on these things. Um, so dealing with discernment, and um, I feel like this is a much more biblical and a much safer position to hold, and we do this in so much in, uh, in other elements of our lives, is that we just don't we just up and trust any uh, Joe Schmo spinal surgeon to jump into our back and start taking vertebrae apart. You know, there has to be qualifications, there has to be history, there has to be uh, doctrinal application, understanding the physiological and physical ramifications of doing those things to the human body. Um, and the same thing applies when it comes to, as Titus directs us, with sound doctrine. So I don't understand, from me being in the Word of Faith for 23 years, give or take, I see a lot of this, um, and obviously there's edge cases, et cetera, exceptions, and we can't go into all of that every single time we have this nature of discussion. But there seems to be this default position, especially with Brown and Storms, um, exemplified in this, this conversation where we're just going to take them at their word. We're just going to swallow it whole. If you saw a unicorn, okay, I believe you. If you saw a, a, a 900 foot Jesus that gave you the cure to cancer, like Oral Roberts touts, then we're just going to take it face value. Um, and Brown may go the route of, well, how do you know? How do you know? Um, Storms, um, his tactic tends to be a lot more along the lines of, well, um, uh, I heard his profession of faith, and he mentioned this in the conversation on multiple occasions. I've heard this profession of faith, but the problem is there's this whole erroneous presupposition that that's all that it takes to be a Christian um, and adhere to living your life throughout as a Christian. I would be pretty sure that storms wouldn't submit to the notion of hyper grace and that someone can say, oh, I've given a profession of faith, so now I'm going to commit you know, vast sexual immorality. I'm going to pull off all the sins that I want and I'm still expecting to go to heaven. There's no way that he would agree to that. And yet mm -hmm. somehow, just because he heard Benny Hinn give a profession of faith, just because he heard Todd White give a profession of faith, they're doing things that are vastly more dangerous to the body because they will literally lead millions of people to hell. This is exemplified by his supposed super, super close brother in Christ Bickle, who he knows to the depths of his soul that we've addressed earlier. So why it is that we have to have this default position of, well, he says he believes in Jesus. So therefore I'm just going to swallow whole what he's giving the people that are in Matthew seven, that Christ says, depart from me. I never knew you. They know Jesus. They profess Christ, but it's not the biblical Christ. And so when I was, quote unquote, deconstructing into real Christianity out of the word of faith, that chapter specifically is incredibly scary because of that notion that they know who Christ is. So you cannot just accept somebody's profession of faith, and therefore you cannot just accept their doctrine because they have a profession of faith. And that's what Storms 
has stood on. And that's what's kind of, forgive my terms, biting him in the butt in regards to the Bickle situation. That's what makes a lot of Michael Brown's Swiss cheese theology so dangerous and that he has this ability to have a default position to go out and defend Benny Hinn. And yet this is where we were talking about, you know, the, these teachers that damn themselves to hell because they teach things like the, the nine head Trinity or the prosperity gospel or the little gods theology. I mean, like the list is countless with these individuals. And again, in the context of this conversation and a lot of what the, the, the three of us deal with on the day to day is these teachers it's not just one small thing. It's not just like a little error that Peter was walking in and Paul had to come along and, you know, have a conversation with him. These are outright rank heresies. It's easy to call out Todd Bentley because everybody's calling out Todd Bentley, you know, but it is honestly just as easy almost with many other people like Todd White, like Benny Hand, because it's just a stream of things that they're doing. And so it takes a lot, as you said, David, a lot of cognitive dissonance to just look over this stuff um, because they come from this position of, oh, he says he professes Jesus as his Lord and Savior. So therefore, I have to believe it when there's a saxophone player that looks like Jesus standing at the end of the bed or handing out cookies or you know, all these things that we hear, like on the Sid Raw show, the, the, the ludicrousness, um, I, I think it's Troy Brewer with his numerology. And, you know, he's constantly looking for these numbers inside of the New Testament. I'm like, OK, so are we just overlooking what the Bible says about looking into omens now? Um, you know, we, we have Sid Roth apologizing for his um, quote unquote prophecy in regards to Trump. You know, so it's like, so we're going to overlook that as, as well. Like, what is it going to take? You know, as, as you guys were saying. So I think a lot of the lack of discernment comes from the fact that, oh, well, if we just hear somebody have a profession of faith, then what they profess, what they profess after that is there for in truth, um, which obviously that led this whole roundtable of discussion down the uh, Second Timothy 316 um, uh, or second, sorry, Second Timothy 312. Um, uh, deceived and and, and you know, people that men that are deceived and and continue to deceive um but yeah i just it's very hard to accept the sale of somebody who is a false prophet who michael brown is and he is a false teacher um, are, are both of you guys previously coming out of charismatic theology then so i i know you are daniel are you as well are you yeah afraid? Yep, that's so when I uh, when I first started really digging in, I was being fed a lot of um, a lot of NAR hyper charismatic garbage. And so I got really uh, intertwined with Todd White. And that's actually I contribute Todd White to why I really started uh, digging into my Bible and knowing like what the Bible said, because he misused scripture so badly that, you know, all you had to do was read it and say, that's not what it says. Like you're completely twisting what you're trying to say. The scripture says, and, um, so you know, what's really interesting. Have you guys watched the, uh, the remnant radio, uh, series that they did on Todd white. Yep. You've watched that, right? Same parts. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so I I didn't know it was out there. I mean, it's an older video, three years ago or whatever. Um, but I watched it all three or four segments or whatever today. I watched them all just because I, I found them to be fascinating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, <laughs> the thing that I found to be fascinating, the the thing that got me the most about that guy is this. I he doesn't know theology at all. He doesn't no, hardly no. know his Bible. No, like no. he he doesn't actually know it. Like they were talking in one of the segments, they were talking about um about kenosis or the Lord setting aside his divinity, right? Yeah. And that yep. the, this is obviously something that he teaches. He has taught that before. That's why they brought it up because Remnant Radio was trying to run interference for Todd White. Yes. That's the reason why they're doing that. But this is the crazy thing. And anyone with a brain can actually see it, that they're talking about it. And Todd, Todd White says, 
he's like, they're like, so Todd, do you believe that, <laughs> that Jesus, um, you know, stopped being God. And do you believe that he, when, when he was on the earth, that he um, set aside his Godhood and sh like three questions like that, they asked. And then he said this, I think what you just said is totally unbiblical, not in there at all. Absolutely. Jesus never ceased being God. He was God the whole time, f um, fully God and fully man. And, and he's talking and he says like this, he says, and, and what he did then when he came down from heaven is he laid aside his divinity and, you know, he, he lived his life as a perfect man and, and the, wait, and then, and then they interrupt him mm -hmm. and they say, to him now now wait a second now i i totally understand what you're where you're coming from when you say that he laid aside his divinity you don't really mean that he stopped being god do you oh yeah no yeah no i don't mean that no okay they're coaching him the, yeah all right, there, there's a football player, okay, who's a very famous football player in Chicago that I will not name just because it wouldn't be nice to name them. But I know who they are, like a Chicago Bears player and in history. And people said that, like, the guy was, like, as dumb as a bag of rocks, right? Like, all he could do is just run and catch the ball. Like, that's it, okay? Doesn't matter who it is. But what I'm saying is, like, I'm wondering, after watching that, if, like, that's actually what that guy is. That he's, that he's like, uh, like a very passionate, very intellectually stupid person. And I'm not saying that, like, to be a mean. I'm not, like, being mean. I I'm, I'm just, I'm saying, like, he's, like, intellectually, like... He just he doesn't even know the Bible and just spouts whatever just because he's like really dumb. Um, mm -hmm. Is that am I totally off base? No, <laughs> not at all. He's been corrected by quite a few people in different ways. Uh, Michael Brown actually brought up the fact that he's been coaching him in mm -hmm. his sermons. And uh, there was at one point Todd White gave a. Uh, um, a repentance video, we'll say. He he like came out and said, I haven't been preaching the whole gospel and I never knew. Like this person should, he should have stepped down right there and said, if I didn't know the gospel and it's been this long and I've been teaching, I'm stepping down and I'm going to go sit underneath some sound teaching. But that's not what he did. And I was actually really hopeful because the way that his video was, he seemed very like sincere. And the very next video that he put out, he doubled down on everything and he was angry. And mm -hmm. um, he just washed away everything he had just said. So I think that there's a point where he is, he, he's dumb. He really is. But I think that he also is, um, you know, people like their people. People want to be appreciated. They want to be liked. They want everybody to look at them and tell them how great they are. And as soon as he started to say, wait a minute, I'm not speaking the whole gospel. I'm just guessing that he didn't get the praise that he was expecting for that. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think that we as a people need to care more about what God thinks and right. less about what people think. And because he's not so smart it's easier for him to care more about what people think because he doesn't really know God. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not giving him an excuse saying that he's dumb. I'm not even close. That guy's the, the very, very much a false teacher all the way. But, but I'm, I'm just like, just watching it. I was shocked at how, how little he knew about the Bible and theology and and it, like throughout it those guys at remnant radio were were coaching him they were coaching him and helping him to come to a more orthodox answer okay because they they at least know what 
in some regards, an orthodox answer is for some of these questions, you know, and even in the comment sections section in on YouTube, which is typically really bad comments, you know, like theologically bad comments. Um, but many of the comments were this Todd very obviously has never gone to Bible school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. okay like or something you know something to that effect right and i thought huh it's interesting because so many of the comments were also like you're the best todd i see you. you're such a lovely brother you're so sincere you're learning like the rest of us but but even if that were the case he's learning like the rest of us He's still a false teacher but he shouldn't be teaching at all anyway if that's the case like the Bible says that teachers are held to a higher standard, stricter standard. Like, man, on the final day of judgment, that's the thing that scares me probably the most because I'm a pastor, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I preach. And like, man, that's it seems like a person like him doesn't have any fear of that, though. Yeah, I agree. He, he's an echo. I, I find that Todd White is an echo chamber, you know, for who he's hanging out with. So he'll do, uh, he'll draw a lot from Bill Johnson, for example, you know, and, and to speak of Bill Johnson, you know, they had their whole, what is it, rediscovering Bethel thing in regards to the canonic heresy. And there's Bill Johnson saying, no, 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 we don't believe in the canonic heresy, et cetera. You know, it's like a 12 minute video. 15 minute video or whatever so in the first two minutes he's he's doing damage control not the canonic heresy blah 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 and i think around the 10th minute he performs the canonic heresy i'm like what are you doing man like you don't even understand your own theology and to kind of bring it back to what we we're discussing as well is that um you know you see all these people like you were saying with michael brown is is coaching todd white um but you in these situations, and you guys probably see it a lot too, there's patterns to all of this stuff. There's systems in place, and quite often they're negative systems. For example, um, what we're seeing with uh, uh, discernment, what we're seeing, I think, is a good comparison between Remnant Radio and Michael Brown. The dangers between these individuals is these are the guys that are opening up the gates to the fields of flock mates and letting wolves in. They're letting the Jennifer the Clares in. They're coaching the Todd Whites to come in and talk to the body. They're 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 platforming David D Diga Hernandez. They're platforming Heidi Baker to come in, um, so that these individuals just are. It, you know, I, I like it. I can't remember. I think it's Philadelphia that's facing like such a massive fentanyl crisis. The, there's people just walking around the streets like zombies. But it gets to a point which perhaps is not a hyper accurate metaphor. But you have to consider, okay, what's worst here? Is, is it the drugs that these people are getting or is it the drug dealers that are bringing it in? You know, So we have a situation with Remnant Radio where they're bringing people in like this. They're coaching them, trying to correct them in front of everybody to make them seem like they're orthodox. They're trying to have excuses with M Michael Brown's situation. Well, you know, I've never really looked into the Benny Hinn thing, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you know what? If you're not going to take the time, even he even said in the round table that he he is a leader in 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 the charismatic scene right which is the truth and he obviously is aware of this but if you're not going to take the steps forward and the things that the bible instructs you to do with first john 4 um, by testing the spirits or if you're just going to completely overlook john 7 24 do not judge by outwards appearances but instead use righteous judgment all you're doing in this conversation it was exemplified heavily is outward appearance you're taking the words of mike bickle you're looking at oh this guy made a profession of faith but there isn't righteous judgment um so the fact that they continue to platform these people is so detrimental to the body of christ and this is something that jim osmond jumps on them for you know this is really really a dangerous situation and it's these people that are um so educated and they do have Remnant Radio does have a better theological grounding than Todd White, but it almost makes them more dangerous in that yes. sense because they're introducing these people. You know, they have an element of trust. So in Michael Brown's case, I'm sorry, you don't get to have the privilege to go out and, and frivolously endorse people just because of the word of your son-in-law. You don't get to go out and, and endorse Sid Roth if you're not going to take the time 
to actually be the leader that you have already admittedly um, expressed that you are in the Christian community, but you're not going to call out false teachers, then you need to withdraw yourself from the conversation of endorsement because you're you're not practicing sound discernment across the board. You refuse to call people out that are false, people that are obviously dangerously false like Benny Hinn, you won't call them out, but you'll go ahead and endorse people that are feeding people into the body like your remnant radios, like your Sid Roth. And so that I think illustrates across the board how bad the discernment has really gotten with somebody that is really intelligent and is really gifted in the polemics of, of you know, the base of Trinitarianism. Mm -hmm. Well, he's, he disqualified himself when he decided he wouldn't call out false teachers. And when in the video, he said over and over again, I don't watch Christian TV. I I don't watch it. I haven't, I haven't seen so-and-so say this, or I haven't watched their TV show or whatever yet. He's lying. He's lying. Because when they were talking about Bill Johnson and they showed the clip of Bill Johnson, he said, well, you have i'm sure you've seen the video that he did after his wife died it was a beautiful bit and he starts going off about the video that bill johnson did so obviously he is watching christian television obviously he does know some of what's going on it's just conveniently not the things that you know other people are trying to say and when he said that i was like that's interesting because he's already said a bunch of times i don't have time I don't, I don't have time to watch these people, you know, then what were you going to say, Lovey? I was just, I was just going to say, um, I mean, that's why this sit down between those guys. I mean, I hindsight is 2020 and what could have, would have been said in different, you know, if you had more time to think of it than on the fly for sure. But like, man, I'm glad that this conversation happened. I'm glad yeah that uh those guys were indeed called out but here's an interesting question now because because of this what uh, what you guys have so eloquently stated all right so i think i'm pretty sure in the beginning of that conversation um that osman or i don't know if it was osman who said it or if it was Brown, no, it was Osman who said it, that we come to this oh man, we come to this conversation believing that you two are brothers with us, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm pretty sure that they said that, right? Like, in the beginning mm-hmm. of, I think so. of that. So, Osman, at least at the time, up until, up until, I, between then and now, I don't know. But at the time when they had that conversation, you know, we, they both believed that, Michael Brown is a Christian man, you know, mm, right. and and just one that disagrees profoundly. But this is the thing. I think maybe they think that because, and of course, again, I can, I don't know his heart either. And and I the, the, I understand all all we can judge is just the outward actions. All we can say is the fruit, yeah. the, the fruit is false teaching. Therefore. If a person is promoting and giving, and I would even say that there is a difference categorically anyway, though not punishment wise, I don't think, but there is a difference between a false teacher and a false prophet that Mm -hmm. not, not all false, uh, not all false teachers would fall into the category of being a false prophet, Mm -hmm. right? That there are false teachers who say things contrary to, the orthodox faith um but never claim prophecy you know as a as the source of it um yeah. so um you know and i don't know that either one of them would say even that michael brown is a is a false prophet or i mean a false teacher i don't know i don't know if either one of them would would say that today um maybe they would or perhaps the question is what would they say in private and what would they say in public there you go <laughs> and you know, having the having the discussion, there has to be some kind of um, cordiality. You have to like have sure. some like kindness across the board if you're going to have any kind of a good conversation. So, mm-hmm. if right off the bat they said we think you're a false teacher and a false prophet, I don't know that they yeah. would have had a good conversation after that. Yeah, but good point. 
Um, Storms also raised a point about focusing solely on negative aspects and not like bringing in the good aspects of um, any, you know, charismatic, the healings and the prophecies and stuff like that. So what do you think about the approach that he took when he was saying, um, well, you guys only look at the bad side. You don't look at the good side. Why don't you show the good side of the charismatic groups? It seems to be like a really emotionally manipulative question that he answer, he asks there. Um, I was going to say in regards to that, uh, again, this kind of goes back to the default position. So I can speak to, for example, when um, I really started coming out of Word of Faith, Chris Roseboro was pretty instrumental in opening up my eyes to the exegeti- exegetical application of the Bible. And just because... I was listening to this guy and he would totally agree. And this applies to anybody um, as it should. You don't get to start off as a qualified sound teacher right out of the gate. You earn that, you know? So it took me weeks and months of listening to this man being man. He keeps knocking out of the park. Knocking out. Now there's going to be differences, you know, like he's not, he's not a Calvinist and, 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 you know, from his Lutheran positions are going to be different. Yeah, fine. You know, but we're, when we're talking about not committing heresies, not going way off the map, like Mr. Bill Johnson, um, but doing sound teachings, it's like, okay, now I'm starting to see this person is sound. That's an earned badge. It doesn't come right out of the gate. And so I think that then is injected into this, this this notion that storms is saying well you know you guys are decrying this decrying that and it's like no there is you know the charismatic position um a a lot of these guys tend to be well you're just you're just so skeptical you test so much that you're just skeptical coming out of the gate and it's just such a horrible position blah, blah blah no it's a safe position it's a biblical position you we listen to you and you become a sound teacher. This is why Paul stepped back and he took his time learning. He had his cage stage where he, you know, he he had his experience on the road to Damascus and then he went and trained, you know, and he got he, he went through his deconstruction or whatever. You know, he became sound. He earned that position. He just didn't come right out of the gate. And so when it's in this this conversation of well you know you are just you're just looking always it's always negative with you guys it's always negative and it's like no we're starting from a position of just let's see what you're presenting let's see what you're presenting now it's obviously very easy especially in the word of faith scenarios to say okay somebody gets saved um it's something peters does talk about quite quite a bit too someone gets saved in the word of faith environment that person, I believe, has salvation. But you're in a very, very slippery slope to where you stay in that scenario. Then I don't think that's the case anymore, you know, because now we're starting to get into little gods theology. I can speak things into existence. I'm a god, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I think, yeah, obviously it's easy to say that positive things come out of any camp, negative things come out of any camp. But if we're going to go into it with the undertone undercurrent accusation of hyper skepticism just because we are discernment ministries and we're guilty of oh this guy parted his hair on the wrong side well that in and of itself shows that you have poor discernment of discernment ministries we are trying to be sound we are trying to adhere to what the bible says by exposing the unfruitful works of darkness and we don't stand idly by and forsake the flock we protect our flock mates and we mark and avoid and we point out the false teachers um, so when he asked that question, I was just like, okay, but you're just assuming they were hyper skeptics. I think he kind of alluded to that as well. Um, mm-hmm. so that was kind of my response to when he was bringing that up. Yeah. It seems like, um, Brown has like when at the very beginning, when they showed the, the video of, uh, when Osman called in and was talking mm-hmm. to Brown on his show, um, Brown started going off about well you have all these names that you call people and this and that yet brown goes straight to you know people are hypercritics and people are conspiracy if you if you believe in the nar you're a conspiracy theorist you know Mm -hmm. so he's got all his all these names that he calls he questions other people's salvation unless it comes to his friends as soon as it comes to his friends that's when he's like well i you know i know their heart 
I, I know them. I, I've known them for a really long time. They're a good guy. So it's just a double standard for him. I don't know if you saw it. He put out a video and it was talking about um, unequal weights and measures. Yes. And he was talking to, he was talking about Luther and all of that debacle. And, um, and he kept using the unequal weights and measures and the, the straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. And I'm like, but that's exactly what you do. Hmm. You know, he does the exact same thing. And I, I was something that I could actually talk to him about. He didn't like it very much. Um, but I, I had a short back and forth with him on that. And, you know, he said he just goes to um, pretty much this. You're dumb and you don't know what you're talking to or you, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, defense when you talk to him about stuff like that. But um, what is what is the dangers of prominent figures defending the false teachers and the false doctrine? Like what is the dangers of somebody who's so highly intelligent and so widely accepted across the board? Because, you know, for James White to accept him as a friend and for him to be in with Benny Hinn and all, like across the board, people are accepting him. So what is the the repercussions of that? Go ahead, David. Um, so I wanted to say just about that previous question briefly. Um, why don't we say the good things that are happening um, in the charismatic movement, the healings and so on? It's, it's because there aren't any. That's yeah. why. That's the reason why. And now I'm not saying, I want to make it very, very clear. I'm not saying that God can't heal or that he does not heal. And I'm not saying as a cessationist that God cannot or does not do the miraculous. Of course he does. He does, and we know that he does because he does the most wonderful miracle of all to every single Christian, which is taking out the heart of stone and giving a heart of flesh, and that is a miracle. It must be a miracle for that to happen. So, of course, he still does miracles today. And I also believe that he may do physical miracle today. Now, I don't think it's nearly as common as people think it is. Um, that God would, of His prerogative, answer a prayer in in a in a miraculous way. Um, I think He answers prayers through providence all the time, but that that He answers prayers and uses the miraculous. I don't know how common that is. Okay, and I don't think anyone can possibly know how common it is, except for the fact that, like a lot of times, I think sometimes when people will mention that miracles happen to them and that they're exaggerating it or there's another potential explanation uh, many times but not every time anyway my point is simply this okay the reason that we're not is because there it isn't happening that you know the reason why michael brown blocked me from every piece of social media i can't see anything that he puts out i have to see what other people post about what he puts out because he's blocked me from everything and the reason why was because when i was a jewish missionary on the streets in chicago and i was doing like jewish evangelism and i didn't know this side of him i reached out to him like to develop a friendship with him when i was a young christian missionary a long time ago and um, you know, we know some of the same people within like Jewish ministry and stuff. And then he started posting about this guy, um, Reinhard Bonnke, who mm. was like a South African preacher who would told Africans that if they give him money, that he can cure their polio. And and Brown was saying how Reinhard Bonnke is like best friend and he they love each other and, you know, he's like supports him and everything. And I, I wrote to him privately and I was like, hey, Mike, man, I'm David. We've had some conversations. I'm a you know missionary in Chicago. We share a heart for the Jewish people to preach the gospel to them, you know. But like, dude, like, you know, that guy's actually bad, though, man. Like, I'm just letting you know, like, yeah. he's. He said some bad things, and I have some quotes here for you, you know. And he was like this. How 
dare you say those things to me? How dare you? You're slandering him. You need to repent. If you don't repent, I'm going to blast you on social media. And that's what he did then. And he put my name out there and said, David Lovey is a Pharisee. And they, he said, horrible, uh, 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 what, what was the word that he used? Like, lot, not slanderous, slanderous words against my dear friend in ministry, Reinhard Bonnke or whatever. And then, like, then cut me, you know, blocked me from everything. So, and I was, that was my first exposure to him as being like this. <laughs> like, that's who he really is, actually. Yeah. Mm. That's, that's the real dude is that, that one, you know? Yeah. yeah he's pretty slimy when you talk to him. He, he's not nice. No. I, I've had multiple conversation conversations like messaging back and forth, and he he's just not a nice person. But he throws around the the word slander a lot. Mm -hmm. he, he says a lot of people, oh, it's slanderous for you to say that. Yet he doesn't care when other people slander God. You know, yeah. the, the fact that his friends just slander God left and right, that's not a problem. But you dare not say anything against these people that you do have evidence in what you're, you know, there, there, there's evidence that's online for everybody to see, but you can't say anything about that. Yeah. I was going to yeah. say too, with what you were addressing. Um, uh, so we kind of obviously creeped into cessationism and continuationism. <clears throat> I am a cessationist as well, obviously in my entirety being word of faith continuationist. Um in reality, cessationism is very, very easy to defeat if these claims were true. You know, mm -hmm. I was I saw an, uh, uh, an account the other day, and I'm thinking about doing a video on it, where I plead to these faith healers. There's this little girl, I think, in Indonesia or something like that. And she has some kind of skin condition, and it looks like her skin has sunburned, but at different rates. Her skin is actually eating itself and her hands are now nubs you know, because mm -hmm. the fingers have, are eating themselves, you know, and, and you have situations like this where the, these healings, you know, they, they aren't happening the way that they prefer. Like Todd White has seen eyes grow back in heads and all these, these amazing, crazy things, you know, and it, it's, again, I'm in full agreement that God does work miracles. You know, we approach him with um, Philippians four, you know, with our prayer and our supplication and our thanksgiving and everything we reach out to him in prayer. Um, uh, you know, he, he hears us, um, uh, as we pray according to his will, et cetera, et cetera. But if we were to see the kinds of healings that they were actually professing, then that would in and of, in and of itself defeat cessationists from the empirical view that that just doesn't happen. You know, and in reality, I think you would maybe agree, David, that as cessationists, we are also of the position that we're trying to adhere to the biblical standard because we see that as the way that honors God because of these counterfeits that are out there that do slander. But if we start to see these miracles that do point to God, they don't point away, they aren't false miracles that point away to a different God, then the cessationists would be like, great, you know, let God be true that every man's a liar. If these things are really happening, beautiful, but they're not. You know, you know I really I wanted to make a, a longer case for the doctrine in the movie. I wanted yeah. to. There were there were things I really, really wanted to say that I wasn't able to say. But mm -hmm. one of the things and but we're doing a study series now and I'll probably be able to say them then um, that I'm writing and, and G3 is going to be putting out like a six week study series on the on the doctrine. Um, yes, and. One of the things is this, that, you know, Westminster, I'm sorry, don't want to get off off subject, but Westminster says, we believe those things which are from the Bible and of good and necessary consequence that mm -hmm. are in, that are in the Bible, that were good and necessary consequence that, that cessationism, even without a biblical argument, which I do believe it has, mm -hmm. has of good and necessary consequence that it must be true. And here's the reason why, because the Bible says that the temple would be destroyed. Jesus says that. He says not one stone will be left on another. And Jesus says to Jerusalem that her enemies will hem her in and be, she'll be destroyed, utterly destroyed, demolished, because they did not recognize the time of their visitation. And that happened in AD 70. It happened. Yeah. 
Jerusalem was sacked and the temple was burnt to the ground and gold traveled in between the rocks of the temple and they pried the rocks apart, right? So that um, they could get the gold. So there's no more temple anymore. But here's the thing. The Bible, most New Testament scholars believe that the Bible was completed in 95 AD. All right. So that means that John was writing after the destruction of the temple, the book of Revelation. And there is zero mention of the temple being destroyed. Okay. Isn't that interesting then? So because the Bible doesn't say with a verse, the temple has been destroyed. I guess the temple's still there right now, then. It has yeah. to be there because there's no verse in the Bible that says that it's not there right now. It says right. that it will it will go away at some point, but there's no verse that says that it's not here. No, 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 no. How do I know the temple is not here? Because I can see it that it's not there. It's, right. You can go to the Temple Mount and you can see there's no temple. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? But... So, like, through mere observation... We know that even though the scripture says the temple would be destroyed and the scripture never says that it actually ceased to be in existence during the time of the Bible, yet it has come to cease being in existence because we can tell from history and we can tell from our own plain observation that that's the case. And so, yeah. so the question that you asked, Lee Fjord, is this, like, why don't we tell of the good that's coming out of it? I mean, the, the answer is because there's no baby in the charismatic bathwater. That, yeah. That's really the answer. And and I, I'm not saying that every charismatic church is a heretical church. And I'm not saying that every charismatic pastor is a bad one. I mean, people can hold to the continuation of the sign gifts and still be gospel-focused, Jesus-loving, Bible-believing Christians. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, a person can be saved at a Todd White rally. A person can be saved at that. Why? Because God can save despite the fact that it's a wicked false teacher that's preaching in that pulpit because all he has to do is take his word and apply it into the heart. If there's a word that even shines on the screen. That's the reason why I believe a person can be saved um, and, you know, be a, a, in a Roman Catholic church, that there are Roman Catholics who don't know what the church really actually teaches, but they go to church and like they'll hear the New Testament reading every week and the Old Testament reading and then the reading from the apocryphal books or whatever. Mm -hmm. But like as they're reading the Old Testament or New Testament, can God like take that word? Maybe a priest might be giving a homily and he says, you need to trust in Jesus, you know, and the person believes, yes, of course, of course, of course. Mm -hmm. Michael Brown, you could be saved at a Michael Brown Brownsville thing, dude. Like, praise mm -hmm. God. Praise mm -hmm. God. But that's despite those things. Yeah. It's despite it. It's not because of it. It's the fact that the Lord is greater than Satan. That's why he can save in a place like that. That's how yeah. you could be saved at the Brownsville Revival, because God is greater than Satan. Yeah, you know, even though Satan <laughs> represents himself as an angel of light. Yeah, I was going to say, too, uh, Lee, with... Um... When you had asked about these false doctrines affecting the broader community, you know, so half of my family doesn't talk to me anymore because they are a word of faith. And so something, you know, we've obviously already talked about how, oh, uh, you know, defending false teachers, they get introduced into the body. You know, that's uh, pretty straightforward. A lot of people would obviously know that. But what I also see is, and I've seen it in my family, and I do see it across my research, when I'm doing a video, I see it in all the algorithms of social media. It's, I mean, it's, it's on fire. It is exponentially exploding in popularity and accelerating. But what I see these people, when you have a Michael Brown, when you have a Sam Storms, is what makes them so dangerous is not only are they allowing these false teachers into the body, but these people learn and they watch and they themselves become defenders of false teachers. They see yeah. the Michael Browns doing the defense. They pick up on how, oh, you're even something as silly and simple as, well, you're just a Pharisee. You have a Pharisaical spirit, ridiculousness. But they pick up on these notions from these people that are soft and opening the gates to these wolves and learning to be defenders themselves. Because it's in reality, a, a lot of Christians um, inherently have that 
drive to be like, I have to defend God. Something's going on. I got to, I got to defend this. I got to, you know, we got to go back to sound doctrine. They have that too, but they are misguided. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I have a, a, not to make it about like social media or anything, but I have a YouTube short that I think has gotten 30, 40,000 views. And it's Todd White when he was making that really, really perverse speech about God and comparing him to very sexual things. And so I say, Todd White is teaching things that are unbiblical. What Todd White says in that YouTube short is, um, you know, God watches through your eyes when you're watching pornography and he's there in bed with you when you're committing adultery with a woman who isn't your wife. Uh, but, 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 but God's not mad, you know, and then they go on and everybody that's a, a big majority of people that are on there defend Todd White, which blows my mind because they're fixated on number one. I got to jump to defense. I got to have that. I'm coming out of the cage. I'm going to go to defense mode. And they completely miss the mark. They're saying, well, just because he said that in in, in a, a questionable manner, you know, that let's let's not again throw the throw the the the, the baby out with the bathwater, right? I'm like, you completely overlook the fact that this guy just talked about adultery, sexual immorality, and God's not mad. Then what did Jesus even die for? You know, so sometimes they just go so fast into defending the faith that it's like you don't even know that the faith you're defending is the Matthew seven faith. It's not the the, the, the sound doctrine that Titus teaches us. And that's what I think I've seen in my family. They'll go right into defending Kenneth Copeland, despite the fact that his COVID prophecy is so blatantly and succinctly in error. Um, but because they feel like they need to defend the faith, they need to go to defense of God. You're not defending God, you're defending Kenneth Copeland. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of people don't understand how dangerous these people really are. And they they act like, OK, well, they may, might say some things here and there that are bad or um, that aren't quite scriptural, you know, which I mean, they're blatantly just throwing out the, the Bible and saying what they want. But one issue that a lot of people don't understand is that people are literally dying because of, you know, Todd White's and that that whole word of faith movement is so dangerous it, it it's it's dangerous for the body and it's dangerous for the soul these people don't know the gospel they they don't know what saves them they don't know god and i know somebody personally who almost died multiple times because they had the faith to be healed they they had the faith i know god can heal me and they did all the things they were told because they said, well, you have to have enough faith in order to be healed. He said, okay. And he threw out all his insulin. Mm -hmm. He's like severely diabetic and he almost died from it. That didn't just happen once that happened multiple times. And people are literally not getting medic medical care, not going to see doctors, not taking cancer treatments and stuff like that, because they're told that if they do that, they don't have enough faith. So, yep. you know, for, th for them to be like, boistering up these false teachers these people who are teaching absolute slanderous things about god who are teaching things completely contrary to scripture and then acting like well it's not that bad i mean sam storms defending um bob jones i i was mad when i heard that the the way he said um he he called peter's slanderous he said that was slanderous when peter said that he was sexually immoral well bob jones was sexually immoral that's that's well known and he his had thing was, naked women in his office right yeah he told them yep. to, to strip down and get before naked before the lord yeah he he yep. said god told him to yo he about that, slandering I... god and being an abuser i mean that's total sexual abuse right there and yet in that four-hour video he totally defended him and he he got mad when they called him a sexual abuser. You know, like this is if we don't have any kind of discernment for these are false teachers and to be able to say, like, we need to not allow them inside the body as OK. We need to be able to shut them out and say, until you like speak in a way that is orthodox, in a way that, you know, lines up with scripture teach god how he is and stop teaching all this junk 
if we can't just put them outside of the church, then there's a huge problem because we are allowing this to happen. We're we're helping to bring in the wolves and say, go ahead, just demolish the flock. It's fine. You mm-hmm. know, yeah. it's it makes me mad. <laughs> yeah, that's um, evil. That's the answer to your question. What you just said is, you know, that's the danger that these leaders um, and and particularly the ones that are more accepted in reform circles, um, that's the danger that um, they pose to the church. My my wife was born into a faith healing cult that mm-hmm. her parents were also born into, and her grandparents were in it. And that place is called the Followers of Christ in Oregon mm-hmm. City. It's a famous place because they allow their babies to die. And mm-hmm. many times that has happened. I, I We visited my wife's uh, hometown there in Oregon City. We went to the Follower Cemetery. They have their own cemetery. And half of the cemetery is filled with infant deaths or like baby, baby deaths, like because they got strep throat and didn't take them to the doctor. They're never a lot. They, this guy, their prophet was called Walter White, <laughs> like mm. that, Breaking Bad and, uh, but predated Breaking Bad. And, mm. and, uh, that dude told them that if they ever went to a doctor, they were consigning themselves to hell. Yep. That, that, that going to any doctor meant you're going to hell. And that place still exists. And it it changed Oregon law because before that time, it's like so many children were dying. Like my wife's brother broke his leg, like snapped his leg in half, and they could not go to the hospital on oh a on, on a ski hill. They could not go. So the church has a bone setter as one of the members okay you like bite onto a belt and the dude like yanks your leg wow (laughs) that's like christian science yeah right but but the world but it's because of this it's this man it's this and it's actually that was an offshoot of mormonism which also was an offshoot of like finney like finney and the mormons in upper new york you know like a lot of this stuff and the jehovah's witnesses like a lot of this stuff can be traced back to the mid 19th century mm-hmm. and and the practices that really they didn't begin there, but popularized in America and in the West at that point. Mm-hmm. And and uh, and then it like set the stage for what happened in Azusa and all of that. And 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 that then opened the door to this. Like where we're at right now, man, uh, there's it makes me feel like Jesus is coming back soon. Uh, that that there's so many that's so prolific that Alexander Pagani and Saldivar and all those guys too that like th- they've admitted that theirs is an algorithm revival. They call it. Yeah. Um. That that the YouTube like algorithm somehow catapulted them into massive amounts of viewers and followers. Um, and that really is a huge problem in the church today too. Um, really, really, it's going to, it's only growing. It's only going to grow. That's yeah. why I'm another movie right now called the demon slayers. <laughs> it's happening. I have three interviews for it already. I got Chris Roseborough's interview. Um, I got uh, Steve Kozar's interview. We're going to get a few more before. So you're going to uh, come on here and let me interview after you uh, get the movie out, right? Help. <laughs> absolutely. 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 But, but anyway, anyway, that's it. Because, uh, you know, these guys are so, so really, really bad. They are not only the ones who hold the door open for the bank robbers, they're the getaway drivers. For yeah. Yep. yep, well put. You know. So what do you think about the, um, the Justin Peters and uh, Jim Osman brought up 
Kenneth Copeland and they they played a clip from Kenneth Copeland. And one of the things that Brown said was that Copeland's followers probably don't even know what he's saying when he keeps saying that, you know, we're God. What what do you think about that idea? Like, do, it almost was like, oh, well, his followers are so dumb. They're not going to even know what he's talking about. Uh, it's garbage. <laughs> my um, So my family members that are word of faith and don't talk to me anymore, um, they send money to Copeland. Copeland is probably the main one that they follow. Uh, Andrew Womack is the other one. Um, Jesse Duplantis is another one. Um, and so... It's a ser- it's a serious situation in that number one they just assume that that these followers are so dumb that you know they can't even understand the theology because that's not true at all. Now they don't understand the severity of that theology and how inaccurate it is, but they do understand how Kenneth Copeland defines it. They do understand why I can speak things into existence. They do understand how Kenneth Copeland contorts things by saying God is a loser in the Bible and, and Adam is, is exactly like God, even though Adam sinned, which blows my mind. But, um, you know, so therefore we are God. So I can tell you a conversation I have with my family member when I was living in the same state with them. And I was at one of those kind of like chicken biscuit kind of restaurants, you know, we were going to go out and I think go hiking or something like that. And uh, I outright asked him, I was like, do you believe the you are little gods absolutely yes um so they know they know and and i do not believe at all i would say now this is purely conjecture but the the um scenario that they're presenting that these people are ignorant enough to not even understand what copeland is talking about is a really 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 small small amount of people very small percentage um there's a reason that these people get pulled into these things. There is an attraction, which we have to have the grace to have some understanding for, even though it's heretical, it's not biblical, it's not the gospel, but we have to understand what pulls these people in. And if these people don't understand what's pulling them in, then they won't get pulled in to begin with. They get pulled in because they're promised healing for today. They get pulled in because there's prosperity for today. Um, And it's these things that pull them in, they have to have some essence of understanding. And so to, to make the statement that, oh, they don't even know what they're listening to or whatever. Well, that may be true for some, but I, I, I refuse to believe that that's the case because you know, this is how they were kind of trying to appeal that this is the fringe of the charismatic movement. And that's not at all true either. I can say that from my own personal experience, from being in the charismatic movement for decades, I can say it from my experience of seeing what it's done to my family. And I can also say, hey, Dr. Storms, what's going on with your friend from four decades? You know, it's not the fringe movement because even your best friend is, 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 doing these things that have led him down this horrible path. Um, So it's not the fringe at all. And I think even just swiping through social media these days, there are so many new prophets and apostles that it's rampant. Um, So when I see these people on social media, uh, you know, Proverbs 18, power of life and death is in the tongue. They, they, they don't understand the exegetical application, but they do understand it and how Joyce Meyer taught it to them. Yep. They do understand Romans 4, 17, speak things as though they weren't, well, she just happens to leave out the part that Paul's talking about God and not us, but they do understand how um, Joseph Prince taught it to them. So I refuse to believe that that's the case, that these people aren't understanding what they're being taught. And I think the fact that we're seeing such an exponential explosion of this theology also solidifies that, that, that they, they understand they're getting something from it. It's, yeah. it, it's it, ear tickling is ear tickling because it's effective. So it's going to continue to work and draw people in. It makes me wonder what he thinks of his followers. You know, it, it, does he believe that his followers are so dumb they don't know what he's saying because he he speaks so out of both sides of his mouth? Mm. You know, I mean, does Michael Brown really think that his followers are dumb is really a question that I have. Because if he's saying that about Kenneth Copeland's followers, 
just, you know, makes you think about how he's going to think about his own. And yeah. you're talking about who's on the fringe and who's not. And it's like, you know, I know people who are the people who are getting pushed or I would say the people you hear a lot about when you are in the charismatic circle or you're talking to anybody in the NAR, um, it's it's always the same people. These, these aren't the fringe. You know, when you right. when you look at Joyce Meyer, when you look at Kenneth Copeland, these are the people that people are looking up to. And you can watch the um, the the theology from one teacher go to another, go to another, and trickle down. And you can wa- just watch it in the line of um, no, it's not fringe because that's what people are believing. That's what mm-hmm. a large amount of people are believing. You yep. know, Bill Johnson has a huge following, and it's spreading. I mean, you talk to Richard Moore; it's it's in Germany. They're taking over churches in Germany. I hear about um, them in Africa, like they're everywhere. Like this isn't just a small matter in the United States. And I really think that we need to start. um, Jake Elliott was supposed to be a part of this discussion. And he talks about a lot of stuff. And it's like, we need to start looking out in, you know, Germany and Africa Mm -hmm. and Australia and go see what what this is turning into worldwide because it's everywhere and yep. you know we we talk about so many things in the United States because this is our little bubble but we need to start showing like the bigger view that this is literally affecting the world you know mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mainstream Christianity is what people get to see typically not biblical Christianity and even skeptics that's what they get to see. They get to see, I'm doing a video right now on George Pearson's and they're talking, Kenneth Copeland Ministries has just released a whole series of videos um, on healing. And they're sitting there in front of the camera, both of them wearing glasses, you know, and, and referencing the, the book that she wrote 40, 50 years ago. And I'm like, so we know your book doesn't work. We know your theology doesn't work. And, and just the audacity, there's no fear. There's no fear that you're going to sit here and teach it. And that's something that my family has fallen privy to. I would, I would ask my family member, they, they smashed their foot years ago. They, they have some heart conditions or bad knee, you know, Hey, how's it, how, how's, how's your back feeling today? You want to go for a walk? Uh, you know, by his stripes, I'm healed. And I'm just like, right there, right there. That's not what that's talking about Isaiah 53 or first Peter, you know, but it is to them how Kenneth Copeland has taught it to them. And that's what they're clinging on to. You know, that's the tickling of the ear and it's not fringe at all. It's, it's absolutely mainstream, but is it Christianity? No. Yeah. You know, one of the things that um, I was thinking about while watching the video was Brown was talking about when he got sick and um, he was talking about how, you know, I know that God can use things through sickness. I know he can use sickness and we can glorify him through it. Mm-hmm. But when I got COVID, he said, let's set aside the the theology right now. When I got COVID and he, he's talking about, let's lay aside what the Bible says and let's go to experience. When I had COVID, I was so sick. I couldn't get up. I couldn't think straight. I don't know how I could glorify God like that. And the way that he was talking about it was so like, God can't glorify, can't be glorified through sickness. Well, dude, I got COVID twice. I'm a COVID long hauler. I have chronic pain. I have chronic uh, inflammation, chronic, all kinds of things, right? Chronic brain fog, just all kinds of uh, breathing issues, all kinds of stuff. God gets glory through that. And he uses that for his glory all the time. When I was super sick, I I watched over and over again, people just looking at the the way that I was um, at peace, the way that, you know, God just helped me through so much stuff. And they were like, man, that's amazing that you have, that you have that peace in the midst of everything going on. It's like, that mm-hmm. glorifies God, you know? Yeah. I think there's a problem with how Michael Brown 
made that statement though. Well, I didn't see because of how I felt and because of how I was looking at things. That's kind of the problem. You know, that's not what uh, Johnny Erickson taught. Us. It's it's not, well, I feel stuck in this chair and I feel like I can't really use my arms effectively. You know, if that's the focus of the witness, then you kind of lost the point to begin with. So if you're going to use this subjective experience of the fact that you didn't feel good during COVID, so you couldn't go out and do ministry as you define it. Um, I think you're missing the point, you know, um, there, it's, it's interesting as we have this conversation unfolding, just how many examples come across, uh, that we come across that shows a lack of discernment. You know, you're, you're, he, he's right there trying to define how sickness isn't going to glorify God because he doesn't feel good. That's kind of the point. You know, somebody could look at the fact, well, if intelligent Brown could be sick with COVID and rest, then that could that could witness to somebody. A lot of people have a hard time resting or taking a Sabbath, however you want to put it. Um, But yeah, there's just so many issues with uh, the discernment of uh, that keeps cropping up, even in in that example in and of itself. Yep. So um, there was, there is a debate about the interpretation of certain theological concepts such as cessationism and continuationism i believe that it leads to a language barrier and it make they make it worse because as soon as somebody says something they they reinterpret it for them and they say no this is what they actually meant how do we bridge that gap in the language barrier that happens you know they have such a a distorted view that they spout out about cessationists how do we like bring the camps together and just be like, no, this is what we believe. And you can just, this is how you understand it. Well, I know how you would love You already did. <laughs> I mean, I look, I want, I wanted to make a case. I just wanted to make a case, you know, a theological case for the doctrine of cessationism. There's only so much you can put into a film. There were parts of the film that, um, like even less uh, the director would say that if, if he could remake the film now, he would do a few things a little bit differently. I would too, um, actually. And, and I don't know if you guys follow the cessationist movie Facebook page, but Les has kind of found his cage stage cessationism. If you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah. yeah on, big time <laughs> on that. Cause it's, Les, it's good though. Les is the one who posts there, you know, he's, he's the admin or whatever, but mm. there's been a couple of times that people have said to me like, Hey, you're, you're talking crazy, but, <laughs> but it's not me anyway. Anyway, so much of this needs to be defined when we're like what we're talking about, but here's the problem. I've tried to define it. I've defined it and still the same arguments are still being used. Let me let me say it this way. Uh, I've said in the film, in the very beginning of the film, that, um, you know, a cessationist can believe in miracles, okay? Like a cessationist is not trying to limit the power of the Holy Spirit. We're not saying that. We're saying that he gave uh, abilities to people in the first century, to both the apostles and those associated with apostolic ministry, which is another thing that they keep bringing up and they know, that's why I made a video about it the other day, they know the answer is what I'm about to say, but Michael Brown will pretend like he doesn't know this, that, um, that the apostles could bestow apostolic gifts upon others. That's what the apostle Paul says in Romans 1, when he says that he want, he desires to come to them to impart a spiritual gift to them. We cannot impart spiritual gifts to people. I can't lay my hand on someone and give them the gift of teaching or the gift of hospitality or the gift of encouragement. I don't, I don't have the ability. We don't have it because we're not apostles. But the apostles, it seems from the text and from Acts, I think, 19, where it says that the apostle Paul was in Ephesus and he laid his hands on 12 men and they received the Holy Spirit and began prophesying and speaking in tongues. They had previously had never, didn't hear that there even was a Holy Spirit. And then Paul imparts to them the spiritual gift of prophecy and tongues. He's imparting it. That's why other people could do miraculous apostolic sign gifts 
other than the apostles. Okay. It's like so simple. Okay. It's like so plain, so simple. The Bible even says it like boom, 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 exactly shows it. That's what Paul means when he means in part, right? But these guys, they'll continue to parrot. Whoa. How come other people could do it? Like, no, no, you know why. They're purposely, purposely not giving that answer because it defeats that entire argument. That's what it doesn't. I don't even think there really is much of a language gap. I think that the. Well, OK, let me rewind. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. And you know what? I think the language gap actually has to do with prophecy in particular. That's what it has to do with, because um, because Wayne Grudem has redefined prophecy and all of these other men, Storms, Brown, everyone else takes from Grudem and says that prophecy is something that God merely brings to mind that you wouldn't have otherwise thought of. That's what prophecy is to them. And prophecy can be mixed, and prophecy in the New Testament is of a lower grade and caliber than the prophecy of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, prophecy can be wrong, and prophets can be wrong. That's why you got to test what the Word says. And you hear, like, storms say, oh, no one would ever go to Isaiah and say to Isaiah... Um, we need to test your words. Like, wait a second. I I don't think that that's true. I think that in the in Isaiah's contemporary time, people still tested the prophets and wanted to make sure that what the prophets were saying was really from the Lord. You know how I know that people tested the prophets because even wicked kings tested the prophets. That Ahab says to Micaiah. Come in here. I need to test because all my other prophets are prophesying to me one thing. And uh -huh. Micaiah, he never says anything good about me, but I'm just going to bring him in to test it. That's what he's doing, right? Uh -huh. Isn't that an interesting thing that yeah. that like that even there, Micaiah, who is a true prophet, was tested on his prophecy. Now, of course, the man failed the test. <laughs> Micaiah didn't fail. Ahab failed. Because mm -mm. If, if he would have heeded Micaiah's words, he never would have gone up into battle and be shot with an arrow from a random archer, right? Like, ha ha. So, so anyway, the point is this. They've redefined prophecy, which I think they will answer to God for, for doing that. Mm -hmm. I, I think... Uh, I'm not I'm not saying that Wayne Grudem is not a Christian. I'll say this. He believes that his wife is a prophetess. And that tape that I found, which my friends got for me that was in the film, um, showed a lot more about Wayne Grudem than just what we aired in the film. I have two hours of Grudem talking about prophecy at a tiny church prophecy conference in the 80s. And he's saying crazy stuff in that. And he, mm. he, he said to him to. My friends, as they were driving, um, Wayne and his wife, that his wife is a prophetess and that as they're driving, she can tell you how many demons live in each house that they drive by. Remember by that, yeah. Like, what? That's Wayne Grudem, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, uh, another thing, too. In regards to the language barrier, um, this is something that Jeff Durbin excels at. He is so good at this, is having the integrity and the honesty to accurately represent the position of your quote unquote opponent. So understand and put the effort into understand what continuationism actually is. Understand what cessationism is and don't just jump to your defense, but understand what your opponent actually believes before you start taking it apart. And I think that that has a lot to do with the barriers that we see. And as David was saying, because so many times, a massive percentage, it's, oh, well, then you just don't believe that God does miracles. And it just gets to where it's like, ah, uh, you know, it's, it's just so base level. It's like, okay, so then you have literally put no time no time at all to understand what cessationism is, um, you know, and, and I get a lot of the whole um, uh, first Corinthians uh, 13, 10, the perfect, you know, face to face, all of that. A lot of people 
saying, oh, you know, that that's supposed to be Jesus, this and that and the other. A lot of cessationists don't die on the hill utilizing 1 Corinthians 13, 10 in accordance with their cessationism. I personally do think that the perfect points to the canon, but I also don't live and die on that hill. And, and, and my cessationism is not revolved around that one singular verse. So again, if you're just going to throw that at me, then it's you haven't even understood our position that we look into the entirety of the apostolic gifts and how they were foundational and et cetera and all that good stuff. So um, I think doing what Jeff Dermott says is be honest with and, and respectful to your quote unquote opponent and give them the, the, the justice and the respect and the love to represent their opposing theology accurately. And I think we don't even see that in Brown and in storms, you know, because again, they'll say one thing with Sid Roth that they defend, which is absolutely heretical when it comes to somebody that they don't want to call that as a false teacher. Um, so I, I just really think that that would make a big difference just to have the integrity to accurately represent the opposing position. Yeah, absolutely. I have a question. I'm sorry. Sorry. I have a question for both okay. of you. What if you don't mind revealing what is your each of your eschatological position, if you have one? I'd, I'm just I'm curious. I, I say I'm not a lot of things, but what I can tell you is I I won't sit in any um I, I don't like defining myself. I don't oh. like defining myself because it's easier for me to say I don't believe that than uh. to say I fit inside this um theological camp. So that's so that's a position. That's a position that that's I think a legitimate position that you're, you know, still working these things out. Uh, in your own mind well i had somebody telling me i needed to um do some videos on eschatology and i'm like no how about no because one you have to understand the position well enough to speak on each one and mm -hmm. i don't have the time or the effort to put into that and yeah. two i don't know where i fit in that so i can't I, i'm not going to speak on it if i don't know it you know yeah. So there's a reason I'm asking this. Dan Daniel, do you want to share that with with the audience? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, like word of faith would adhere mostly to premillennialism a lot of the yeah. time, pre-trip, all of that stuff. So um, you know, I am also of the position that I'm not necessarily in a camp. Um, I would almost say it's theological laziness at that point, <laughs> because of coming out of the word of faith, I spend so much time just being a Bible nerd, to be honest with you. So I'm not Lutheran. I'm not any of these things. I will say I definitely lean much more reformed. So, you know, I might start pushing towards amillennialism or postmillennialism, but I'm not landed in a particular seat as of right now. Leah yeah, Fiori, uh, are, would you consider yourself reformed or no? <laughs> um, so I think I lean more reformed than anything else, for sure. But um, I I think, what was it that um, Jake called me? I think he calls me a, um, a non-denominational in denial. That's what he calls me. Because <laughs> I, I don't want it. There, there's problems with so many different camps and I see a lot of different issues huh. that I don't, I just don't want to like be labeled. I just believe what the Bible says, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, so the, here, the reason I'm, I'm asking that question, you're the one who's asking questions. So I don't mean to steal your thunder, but, <laughs> but the reason I was asking that question is just because you know, the three of us come from different places, you know, mm -hmm. and that and that we might differ on secondary issues like these things. And mm -hmm. and that that that's OK within the body of Christ to have differences like that, that yeah. the things that we're taught. See, because because I think that they paint us as people who are just unnecessarily divisive over everything, mm -hmm. hyper, hypercritical, every hill is a hill to die on. But here's the problem with that. It's not true. Mm -hmm. I don't believe every hill is a hill to die on. I have, I hold some doctrines with an open hand, you know, I'm premillennial and, mm -hmm. and I'm a Calvinist and I hold my Calvinist stronger than I hold my premillennialism, um, for instance. Right. But, um, but I am premillennial, and 
And I've never been convinced otherwise. And many of the people that I associate with think I'm totally nuts for being premillennial. <laughs> and, and like, I'm like, I'm like a MacArthur kind of premillennial, basically. Mm. Mm. Lead- dispensationalist so it's like small r reformed but like that the people even in a reform pub would be like you're not reformed you know <laughs> whatever anyway my point is this right like those things are also issues that are important and serious and mm-hmm. and we should consider them right i mean we should even consider our eschatological positions because they're in the it's in the bible you know we should consider those things but so then why are we like engaging so much in this particular area of theological mm-hmm. discussion the reason why we're engaging so much here and saying this is different from just some secondary issue, strange, uh, you know, this is some maybe some strange secondary issue position, but no, no real problem. The reason that we're focusing on this is because these ministries are are heretical and a danger to the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. And and I, I would not spend my time. There are people who do such things, but I would not spend my time like trying to defeat every Presbyterian and make them a Baptist. I mean, there's people who have those kinds of uh, outreaches, <laughs> but, but like, but that's, I don't, I don't think that, you know, that's less important of a, of a battle to fight in the church right now. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, we're fighting in the church right now for like gospel truth. <clears throat> yeah. And, and this is man, Man, it's it's scary the, uh, how very quickly, um, you know, this is what the church has become. It, yeah. is, is so that so that these people are invited to meet the president, and yeah. in in the highest echelons of, um, you know, religion. That's that's what this has become when that was it Paula White that went in and yep. was on the council, like yep. all the worst people possible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like he's going to bring in Paula White, James McDonald, the sinister minister. If you know anything about that, dude. Mm-hmm. OK, <laughs> like, I think I think maybe Driscoll was even invited to that. Like, I think on. Kenneth Copeland was, too. Yeah, I've heard that, too. Yeah. That's so bad then. That's like that means this is not that means this is not the fringe. Yeah. The fringe, yep. the fringe yep. isn't invited to meet the president. <laughs> it's it's invited to pray over the president. I mean, you know, you see them standing over touching him. Like if if you have hands on the president, that's like you're pretty big. You you're very well known, you know. That's crazy. You know what? That's so crazy. That's the first time I thought of that. The fact that like that, like that's the president. That means it's not the fringe. That's mm-hmm. what it means. Yeah, it's a good point. It's the main it's it's the main thing now. I mean, here's the here's the question. It's like. Uh, can can the average charismatic church. Do they have an off switch? This is something I don't really know because I'm not I'm not in charismatic circles, you know. I never was and 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 I'm not now. And so my question is like for both of you coming out of it, is there an when I say an off switch like um like a place in a charismatic church that would be where they would be like whoa whoa that's you guys are going too far now. Like or is there no limit in the average Joe Schmo charismatic church out there? Is there no limit to the kind of manifestation of craziness? So um, I think it depends on what church you're going to. Hmm. I, I really think that it depends on um, where they set their limits because every charismatic church that I know of has like a different um, stopping point, we'll say. So I, think, I was just going to say, um, you know, there's video that came out of Bethel where people were walking through a fire tunnel and there were at the end of the fire tunnel, there was a guy with a puppet talking to people. 
hand puppet. And then there was a, two guys that were embracing. And the one guy, it pretty much looked to me like he was kissing him on the neck. And the guy was giggling and everything. Then they ended up on the floor, still kissing him on the neck. I mean, like he's nuzzled in there. And so here we have pretty much the pinnacle. The look on Lovie's face. Sorry. That's <laughs> yeah, I'll try and find it. And wow. so here we here we have Bethel Church. And that's what's happening, you know. So these guys are, quote unquote, setting the standard. So there you see how far the spectrum can go. There's obviously um, variances of the spectrum on, on you know, how, how far people will go with that. But if it will go that far, you know, it'll always go a little bit further. Um, so I think that that <laughs> sets a pretty scary precedent of where it could go with the actual mainstream, with the Bill Johnsons and the, the Jen Johnsons and all that. It's it's nuts. Um, so as far as if I've seen a church with an off switch, um, I would say that by the time that off switch has been hit, you've already passed outside of orthodoxy and you're in a heretical position. And so I think it gets difficult for the church at that point to even understand what the off switch is. It's kind of like point of no return. You know, we've already bought into this theology. We're already, we already have these little old ladies coming and preaching. And then when they take their shoes off, somehow miraculously, their toes are covered in gold. You know, it's just like, okay, you just dipped your feet in, in, in gold nail polish before you came out here, but that's a miracle. You know what I mean? It's like, so we're, we're, we're just going to let that slide or there's supposedly angel feathers falling from the rafters. It's just, you, if you're, if you're past, if you're at that point already, then the stop switch is already busted and the light bulb's blown, you know, it's only nitrous. It's only like, you know, what is it? 21,000 gigawatts, you know, from back to the future, like just amp it up more, you know, because we want more miracles. We want more signs. We want more experiences. And that sucks, man, because these people are deceived. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, the Bible says that once we, um, once we have Jesus, we're not going to thirst anymore. We're not going to hunger anymore. And yeah. they, the whole movement is based on a constant wanting more. They're never, they're never satisfied. They're never content with what they have. It, it's a constant. I, I need another experience. I need another word from God. I need another. It's, it's always something I want feelings and emotions and everything that happens. And, um, it, it speaks directly opposite of the fruit of the spirit. You know, there's no self-control. There, mm -hmm. There's no contentment and peace and joy because it's just always uneasiness and striving and wanting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things of the flesh. So I know it's super late for you guys right now. Um, no worries. You guys have both seen the exchanges between Brown and Rosebro, correct? Yes. The whole Martin Luther thing. Yeah. So I don't want to take this on myself. So I figured Lovi would be able to uh, speak on this better than I would. Do um, you think, yep. Do you think it was fair for Brown to change the topic of false teachers to um, bringing up Luther and anti-Semitism? And do you think that this worked in his favor? Which I already know the answer to that. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm on a text thread that um, I don't probably want to say um, publicly who is all on this text thread, but but I I wrote um, about this, and if, if maybe it will help if I just read it for you guys. What what I what I wrote, um, I said. I say this as a Jewish man myself, what Brown is doing plays so much into the Jewish stereotype that we are perpetual victims. Mm. I can 100% appreciate the amazing contribution of Martin Luther to the kingdom of God, while at the same time finding his comments on the Jews and his over-the-top over language to be sinful and wrong. But that doesn't mean that the Nazis were Lutherans. The German church in the Third Reich was not preaching Christ and him crucified, which was the entire and real emphasis of Luther's ministry, was Christ and him crucified. 
I thank God for Luther in that regard. We might not be Protestants right now otherwise. My point is this. Brown is purposely playing into this stereotype in order to divert the attention from the real arguments about false teachers, which is what started this. Now, the conversation isn't on that anymore at all. Instead, it's on Luther. This is a brilliantly satanic move by Brown because he now wins no matter what. All he has to do is say American gospel is anti-Semitic, and that's the Trump card. Watch. This will never be put to bed from Brown. He set this up as a trap, I believe. I think he knew that this would happen, and now he's the victim forever against you Nazi supporters. Okay? This this is why. Now, that being said, I'm going to show you guys something, something interesting. So, I don't know if you can see. I I could Oh, wow. So that's a Nazi coin that I have. Yeah, I have one of those. But on the other side of the coin is Martin Luther. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's that's why I have it. I don't just like collect Nazi coins, but necessarily. But this one has Luther on it. Okay. And so I wanted to say something else about that. I said that being said, <laughs> that I appreciate Luther. Of course, the Nazis use propaganda in the name of Christ. And part of that propaganda was the German hero, Martin Luther. The Germans loved heroes. They would manipulate any famous German of history and make it seem like they would be a Nazi. So, of course, they took Luther's writing that he wrote against the Jewish people and used it as propaganda to make people think that Luther would have supported the Holocaust. But that does not make it so. Nevertheless, okay, this is a photograph of, you can't probably see it. Yeah, it's coming through pretty good. This is a photograph of the Luther Tag Festival in 1938 in Berlin, where they had giant 30-foot crosses um, on banners with swastikas in the middle of it. And so, so I will say this, if you were a Jewish child, maybe eight years old, living in 1938, and you're in Berlin hiding, and and you hear a choir singing, a mighty fortress is our God, and they have a 30-foot banner with a cross on it with a swastika in the middle of it while they're marching down the street with another banner that has Martin Luther's face. And your mother runs over to the window and shuts the window and says to you, holds you, and says to you, uh, son, those people hate us, and they want to murder us, and you should never, ever have anything to do with that stuff down there, okay? I can, just as a human, I can understand then why in addition to the the natural or supernatural veil that is over the eyes of the Jews when they read the law, they cannot see Christ unless that veil is removed, which is a, a supernatural thing. Mm. Added on to that, there really is the history of the Christian church and the way that the church has treated the Jewish people throughout history with John Chrysostom and, um, you know, and Luther and Calvin. And, you know, but that doesn't mean that they're false teachers. This is this was the, the point and that the later Nazis, like, obviously, I do not believe that Martin Luther would have ever supported the Holocaust, for instance. Um mm. So what I'm saying is this, Nazism was not Luther's fault, not even close. Hitler was a complete pagan. And what Brown said isn't remotely true, that Chris's video is going to harm Jews. Like, that give was me so ridiculous. Nobody's going to watch that and be like, let me go firebomb a synagogue. Chris Roseboro sent me. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't believe he said that. Okay, Christians who want to be discerning are not those who are harming Jewish people. On the contrary, we're helping them because there are many Jewish charismatics who need to come out of that darkness. Everyone needs to know that they are, look it, look it, because he took, and this is, I end here. He took issue with Chris Roseboro saying um, that the Jews are enemies of the cross and enemies of the gospel. 
Okay, he took issues with that. What? The average Jew doesn't even think about Jesus. N Michael Brown, you're smarter than that. Don't you know that every natural man is an enemy of Jesus by nature? Like, mm -hmm. shouldn't they be told that they're an enemy of Jesus by nature? Th that's what everyone needs to be told. If yeah. you're not saying that, you're not actually giving them the real gospel. Because the real gospel says this. You are a sinner. You deserve to die. I am a sinner and I deserve to die. I deserve the payment, the penalty for my sins, the wages of my sin. I deserve to be on the cross. And unless a person comes to that place where they believe that about themselves, they can never be saved. Never. Yeah. You cannot be saved unless you believe that. Because saved yeah. from what? Saved from what? Like, oh, my little peccadillos. No big deal. Right. Like, that's what sin is to me. It's no big deal. All right. So this is what I said. Everyone needs to know that they're enemies of the gospel. That's calling a spade a spade. Mm -hmm. And unless a person comes to see that they're enemies of Christ, they cannot be saved. We must preach to Jews that they are God's enemies and under his wrath, unless they repent and trust in the Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ. To say to them anything other than that is not loving. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. And so my suggestion to these brothers who are in the middle of this is to stand firm and not give in to this bully because he really is just pretending to be offended in order to sway everyone to his side. And he's mm -hmm. not really offended. I really don't think so. I think even that part at the end, oh, the, he sent some message where he was like, I'm so sorry that um, our relationship has soured, Brandon. I'm so mm -hmm. sorry. It's like... No, you're not, dude. <laughs> you're, not, you're not sorry. Okay. But again, I, 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 he just seems to me to be very manipulative. So that's my answer. That's the best answer I think that I can give is, the, is what I wrote out there. And, and I think that this is purely him exercising, Brown exercising his immaculate debate, debating techniques. Um, mm -hmm. This is just him exercising that. It's it's so it's like so smart doing doing what he did, bringing Luther in, and now like the whole thing is just Luther, Luther. Huh, you guys use unequal weights and measures. If you're not willing to condemn Luther, I'm not willing to condemn uh Copeland. <laughs> yeah, way to make way to make it so that he doesn't have to actually say anybody's a false teacher well if you won't say luther's a false teacher i'm not going to say anybody else's but yeah, he wanted to deal with the issue at hand he just he added had, another he layer i think lovi just knocked it out of the park with that but yeah it, it's just it's just another layer of obfuscation which is that is brown's absolute specialty um and you know he has that moniker for a reason um but it is and it's really frustrating because we have absolutely fully removed the context away from discernment it's it's he's now actually actively working against discernment and that's i don't think a christian would do that and i'm not i you know i'm not i'm not doubting his 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 uh further for the lord but it's it's definitely the action in and of itself is pretty despicable and i'm very interested to see where his conduct is gonna take him in the near future because there's either an impending theological explosion or some kind of social outcry because it now seems like he is also very practiced at rubbing elbows with um, the Jennifer Leclerc's and making friends with, with people. You know, the, these kinds of people, it makes me think of the, the kid on the playground who doesn't really know how to fight. So he makes friends with all the bullies, you know, and once he's kind of got them in the corner, then he'll make friends with the bullies friends, you know? So now he's rubbing elbows with Jim Osmond and Justin Peters. And now he's trying to do it with Chris Roseborough, you know, even though there's contention, it's going to be interesting to see how he manages these relationships. Because I'm, I'm I think gonna tell you, he's going to write an article for Christianity today. Okay. Mm, mm. This is, I mean, uh, here's my prophecy. All right. <laughs> I got to be careful joking around like that. All right. I just have a prediction. My prediction is that he's going to write an article for Christianity today. And it's going to be something like this. The sins of Luther is mm. what he's going to make some title like this, the sins of Luther. And then he's going to write it like, if you can't condemn statements like this, then you better not be focusing on these tiny little, you know, mm. 
theological differences that you have with everybody else. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is what his tactic is, and this is what he's going to do. And here's the point. The problem with that is that it's apples and oranges. Look at Jonathan Edwards had slaves. All right. Sad to say, but again, that product of one's time. I mean, that is real. (laughs) <laughs> okay, it, he couldn't help the fact that he was born where he was born and when he was born. And, you know, that was a thing back then was slavery and it was not looked upon in the culture as something so terrible. And Edwards treated his slaves very well, by the way, and and he would preach the gospel to them and, uh, uh, you know, he loved them. And so. So anyway, and and so was Whitfield even, you know, but I think he changed his mind uh, at some point. But regardless, the point is that, like, I will take an Edwards or a Whitfield, okay, every single day uh, and or a Luther every single day and twice on Sunday over a Copeland uh, or a Todd White or uh, Jennifer LeClaire. Or a Bill Johnson, okay? Like th- those guys, man, it, he's saying that like racial, maybe ra- the sin, let's just even say the sin of racism, okay? He's equating the sin of racism with the sin of false prophecy or right. uh, false teaching about God. All right. So even if we might say that there was a sinful racism in Martin Luther or a sinful racism in, you know, Jonathan Edwards, let's say, um, but that does not make them a false teacher just because they had some sin in some other area of their life. Like that doesn't mean that that that's the reason why this is such a dumb comparison to say say they have to like. All right, he might obviously uh, disagree with Lutheran distinctions of like consubstantiation and things like that. That's right. a different thing, but he's not even bringing that up. What he's saying is because because Luther's a racist, put it that way, because Luther's a racist, you have to condemn him. And if you don't condemn him, then you have no right to condemn people who say less bad things. But here's the thing. Again, I'm going to probably get myself in trouble for saying what I'm about to say if anyone you know watches this. I think actually that the teaching of Copeland is like worse on an eternal level than yeah. than the things that Luther said about the Jews. It's mm. worse on an eternal level, all right? Because as sad as it was that he called for violence against a group of people, and that is wrong, okay? But but the sort of eternal consequences of believing a false gospel is even worse than that Mm -hmm. yep you know it seems like brown and storms are more concerned with earthly things than they are spiritual things and you know they they focus on healing and they focus on prophecy and all of that but they don't really care about where like a man's soul goes they don't they don't care about who's being um led into destruction they they care more about um, feelings and ex, you know experience, and it's interesting because I think Brown shows it one in the way that um, he is on his videos. It starts off saying that he is your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution, and then he uses tactics that are worldly tactics. You know the the whole. Um, the whole idea of using racism in this conversation to gain a, a jump on what's going on and to be able to like get to high ground, I guess, because he's more moral, is so worldly and he's not focused on this is what God says and this is what we need to stick to. You know, these people are slandering God. These people are leading other people to hell. That doesn't matter because he's friends with them and, you know, they're, they're his buddies and he he's heard them say things that are good. So it right. must be fine. So I think that's the point of the whole conversation for us. The reason I wanted to have this 
discussion, review, whatever, was because it's so dangerous having people who are so intelligent out there trying to minimize truth, minimize God's word, minimize the fact that people like us are we're like okay we need to stick to the word what is what does god's word say no i know these people are doing these things over here and it doesn't look anything like what god's word says you know we need to hold them accountable and bring them back to what god says but when it comes to brown and storms they're like oh no let them do what they're doing you don't know if it's right or wrong you you can't judge that well we have the word we can judge that so I really appreciate you guys coming on, and um, I, yeah. I think this was a great conversation, and wow, it's going to be a long one. I really, really appreciate you guys coming on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> thanks for having us. Yeah, man. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Second Peter 2, verses 1 through 3. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. 2 Peter 2 verses 10 through 22. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as the wage of their wrongdoing, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions, while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For, speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit. And the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Thank you for listening to the Take Me to Eternity podcast. If you have questions or would like to contact me, you can email me at takemetoeternity at yahoo.com. You can find me on Facebook and YouTube under Take Me to Eternity. My podcast is on most podcasting platforms. You can also find my blog at www dot take me to eternity dot com. Thank you for joining me today. It has been a pleasure. Until next time, know truth, love truth, share truth, because Jesus is truth. Be blessed.